So I had a viewer comment recently, and I'll just read the comment here. It says, you know American Pickers is a complete setup for the camera, don't you? Question, question, question mark. <laughs> I don't really understand your complete fascination with them. Well, we're going to talk about that today on The Crazy Picker Life with Wheeler, Dealer, and Banana Peeler. Welcome, fellow pickers and would-be adventurers. Dealer here with the Sunday edition of Crazy Picker Life. Well, it is Sunday. It's my day off. I don't work on Sundays. I do not do a daily vlog of what's going on on Sundays. I use it more as a topic day. Today is no different. I'm down at the shop here, pre Packer NFL, Packers and Giants NFL football game. Lon, my wife, is a huge Packers fan. She will not miss a game unless you know something major would have to disrupt that so we are down here early they're watching uh, the end of the Miami Steelers game personally I enjoy sitting and watching a game once in a while but I'm not uh, I'm not a crazed fan so I get a chance to break away here and talk about one of my favorite subjects picking and more specifically, the American Pickers, Mike and Frank. I've expressed uh, before in this show and in uh, previous videos that um, a big reason I'm picking right now and a big reason that we go on road trips and go on the road and stay overnight and get out and get dirty out there picking a big reason we do that is American Pickers. And I came from a college world. I did a white collar job in a sense. There weren't a lot of engineering, industrial engineering jobs. And I got into a side field and more or less washed out of that. From there, I got into sales. I got into service business. I got into a family business and a lot of those were buying and selling. When, we, when I was with the family business, we had 5,000 items in our store, our uh, wellness health store, vitamins and health foods and healthy organic produce and healthy organic meats and fishes and all kinds of frozen stuff. I was the purchaser for that. Before that, I was entrepreneurial. During that, I was entrepreneurial. After that, I've been entrepreneurial. I've been buying and selling things all my life. I um, got into eBay through buying and selling high-end air purifiers. Buy the new ones, dead stock, wholesale, resell them on eBay at uh, you know retail minus minus a discount, right? I bought and sold uh, diabetic test strips in a big way for a number of years. I put classified ads all across the country. Ads went to a call center. People were screened, sent out kits. People put their test strips in. The kits came to me. I paid them some money. I sold the test strips, excess diabetic test strips. Up until that point, I had been exposed to auctions a little bit. I had ex been exposed to and had my own rummage sales. Um, I'd been maybe to a couple antique stores, but I never really thought about going out and buying from those venues and reselling on eBay. Um, a couple of things happened my son, Wheeler, started to grow up and he went out with his mom to some local rummage sales and he found a few things and we were playing around with selling a few things on eBay that were just too good to pass up. You'd buy them for $5, $10 and you'd sell them for 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 bucks, right? That got my attention a little bit, but the other thing that got my attention 
was here is Frank and Mike in a van driving around seemingly endlessly finding really cool old stuff paying one price and selling it for another and I'm thinking hey they got a shop they're selling it out of that's pretty cool <laughs> I'm gonna sell it online Along with that, I also had Wheeler get interested in cameras, and we started to buy cameras from online websites. There were a lot of uh, Goodwills that had cameras cheap. There were some pawn stores that had cameras cheap. You could buy camera lots on uh, eBay pretty cheap. You still can. And so we were actually buying a lot of things online, and then we thought, well, where can we go find these things? We started at rummage sales. We started at citywide garage sales. We went to the flea market. We started to go to antique stores. We started to expand where we were looking for cameras. And along the way, I started to pick up everything else. And so in a sense, we started to do much, much more American picker type picking. Although we you know, hung to uh, thrift stores and pawn stores and garage sales and things like that. I've probably only been on six, seven, eight, nine, ten picks that would be like, hey, you meet somebody and then you go through all their stuff. A lot of fun, right? I would like to do more of those type of things. However, um, for the most part, our marketing plan is to look for cameras. That's 63% of our business right now. And it's a really good business. It's not one that I'm willing to, to you know, just throw out there. I don't mind going out and picking up other stuff because there's lots of good stuff out there in a lot of different venues. But I'm not going to go full rogue and go American Picker style and find one or two cameras and 200 other things. That's, that's not the mix that we're looking for right now. Okay, so back to the premise here. Is American Pickers real? Or maybe a better question would be, how does American Pickers um, portray picking? Is it accurate? And how does it compare to real picking? Well, those are good questions, okay? Now, the obvious thing, if you look at the show carefully, you'll see that there is a production crew following Mike and Frank around, obviously, right? They have all these different camera angles. Mike and Frank don't have GoPros on them. They don't have cameras in their hands running around. They don't have all these jump cuts and things like that. It's a, it's a full production. It's an amazing production, okay? They do a great job of putting that together. Now, if somebody wanted to follow me and Wheeler and Banana Peeler around, could they put, around, put together a show that uh, was pretty darn interesting? Sure they could, I think they could. You know, add some music, add some angles, put together all the footage, give me somebody to start finding me some pics to go to, and it would, be, it would be pretty entertaining. Now, let's just put it this way. Mike and Frank are very photogenic. They're very likable. They're very um, down-to-earth, real-type Midwest people. They have a few quirks. They're very articulate. Mike is very upbeat. He has a great laugh. Frank is a great compliment. Those guys are suited for that job they're not actors but they've evolved into uh, very likable on tv presences right now obviously this uh, production company that puts this show on they go into the picking set ahead of time they scope it out they talk to the people they do some setup they um, scope the whole thing out. Mike and Frank show up. They do some sort of a dance over the items. They get a lot of footage. Then they edit it. 
So it is canned in a sense, but I believe without a shadow of a doubt that Mike and Frank and maybe Danielle, I think she's part of it for real. And I think she's obviously got a show side as well. I mean, she's got a show business side in her background with both roller derby and some sort of dancing and some sort of other shop she runs. I mean, she's, she's entrepreneurial. She's a show person. She's been in the spotlight. She likes to show off. She's got, you know, crazy look in a sense. She's suited for the role as well. But I also think that she does do some of the phone calling to prospective people. You know, I think she's involved. Probably, probably in a sense, as much time as always, but she does different things than she may have done in the beginning. She probably is doing some of the things now that Mike and Frank used to do when they used to set up picks. I don't know. Mike and Frank have been picking, it seems, for quite a long time, one sense or another. Uh, you know, the research says Mike used to buy and sell bicycles, motorcycles, a little bit of everything, and of course he's polished it up in a sense for the show. Frank supposedly was a building inspector, uh, worked with uh, recharging fire extinguishers, got in and out of a lot of places, has also been looking at stuff and buying and selling for quite a long time, collecting things, cans, whatever, okay? They're both genuinely in the picker field. Now, I guess I was going somewhere with this. I think that trio... Danielle could book appointments, she could find things, she could run the shop, more or less. And uh, I think Mike and Frank got what it takes to actually go out to these picks, buy and sell stuff. So without the production crew, without the setup, without all the angles, without all the editing, uh, I don't know if they plant objects. I don't think so. I don't think they have to. And I'll tell you why in a little while. I think they could pull it off and if it was just a single camera, you'd get a different perspective, but it would more or less be the same pick. Now, when they started the show in 2010, obviously things were different. Now, it's not quite like they're rock stars, but they are like rock stars, okay? So the production value, the rock starness, the oh, everybody knows what to expect ish. It's there. And they're buying more expensive things and they're finding cooler things. Part of that, uh, from my understanding, is people have come out of the woodwork over the years and said, hey, come pick me. And so you get these huge collections, these huge pickers, these obscure things. There's a search on for places that Mike and Frank should go. The places they've went, I don't know if they've gotten better. I don't know if they've gotten more interesting, but certainly there's been some that are just, you know, you just shake your head at. How come I can't get in there, right? Well, the reason you can't get in there is because you ain't doing that kind of stuff, right? They've earned it. Let's talk about that a little bit, okay? When Wheeler and I started picking, some of the things that we picked up five or six years ago were ridiculous. I'd pick up a toy and I'd buy it for five bucks. I'd take it home and I didn't realize the axle was rusted through on the truck toy and the wheels would fall off and I didn't even notice it was super dirty and I probably wouldn't have bought it or that the bumper's half ripped off, and I go to price it, and I'm like, I got one of these things, you know, I got one of these things that's gonna be a score, and I end up selling it for 15 bucks, free shipping, you know, don't make any money. Now, when I pick up a toy, it's because I've looked at 100, and when I pick up the actual toy that I wanna buy, it's either maybe I like it, and I'm not really gonna expect to make a lot of money, or I just know pretty much on a hunch or otherwise which one to pick up. And when I get it home, I've already looked at it. Not, not necessarily um, 
consciously, just subconsciously, I look things over very carefully. I get it home. I know what condition it's in. And sometimes, even like yesterday, I'm still even surprised. And a lot of times it's surprised to the good, right? That didn't happen right away. Same with Mike and Frank. The reason they get to go on these crazy picks and the reason they run into all this awesome stuff and they pull these things out is because they know what to ask for and they know what to look for. It's real. It's real. So, I have been on picks, including one recently. I don't know what I spent, 1500 bucks. My signs are in the back room. Reload, um, go back a couple weeks and look up. Now we're picking like American pickers. Now, that pick that we went on that day was done through contacts. I don't remember exactly how I ran into this guy locally, but we did a little consignment work for him. We bought some things from him. A couple years later, we bumped into him again and bought a few more things from him. Recently, we bumped into him again and we got in on 90% of the good stuff. There's still one pick we can go on with him. We've built rapport over the years. That pick, with all the fancy American picker cameras and everything, that pick could have been a seven minute, 10 minute segment in one of the real production shows, one of the not so interesting ones, okay? I mean, it could have made the show. It was that good. And Wheeler and I found it out in the middle of nowhere through contacts, through word of mouth, etc. right? It's a real American picker like pick. We got some stuff out of there that was pretty good. Probably could have got some other stuff out of there if we would have made it to the last stop. We ran out of time. And so there's some inside stuff that I think is even better. There's also some cool stuff we didn't show that he wouldn't sell. So I, I didn't show it. it was in his house. We got to go into his house. That shows me that obviously these picks are for real. He didn't stage items. Some of the stuff I bought, I'm going to make a few hundred dollars each on. Some of the stuff I didn't buy, I could have made money on for the right price. It's real. Now, there are people out there that are outside of picking, that enjoy watching the show. There are people that are outside of picking that say the show is 100% fake. They don't know what they're talking about. There's also people that pick that spend a lot of their times at garage sales and at um, thrift stores and retail arbitrage, they don't know how to take it to the level of American pickers. And they think, wow, it must be, it's, you know, it, it looks awesome. It looks like um, a treasure hunt, but how do you get there? I, I just, I can't see it. I don't know if I believe it, right? So, the difference between American pickers and what real picking would be is the production and the show and how they put everything in front of the camera. But they have to. How else are they going to do it? Of course, there could be different styles. But look how successful the show is. So that brings me back to this. Here's why I love the American pickers. It shows everything about picking that I love. It shows the romantic part of picking. It shows the adventuring part of picking. It shows some of the characters you meet when you go out picking. It shows some of the adventures you'll be on. It shows some of the good stuff you'll find. It shows the treasure hunt. It shows the profitability. It shows all those things, right? It even shows some of the deal making, the, the bartering, the bargaining, the um, negotiating. It shows some of the pitfalls. It shows some of the um, hard work behind the scenes. But for the most part, it packages it all together in a very watchable, fun way. For a picker like me, that's a fantasy show. I love it. But it's based in reality. It really is based in reality. 
Mike and Frank are two guys that got it together. They got another person in Danielle and or whoever helps, helps them behind the scenes, helps them find these picks. They've got a funnel where these picks fall in the funnel from all the stuff they've been doing and all the ways they gather information on the bottom of that funnel. They got places to go that are really good. They got money in their hands. They're not afraid to pull the trigger. It is true. They deserve it. Now, obviously, if you've ever watched a good biographical biography movie or a good remake of a certain portion in history, you can be drawn to that movie. You can like that movie. You can like the characters. You can like everything that's going on in there. It can be mostly historically accurate. It can be mostly quirky accurate. It can be a good movie. However, that situation and that person's life were not that dramatic. They were not that cinematic. They were not that movie magic. When you watch that type of thing, it's always bigger than life. It's always more exciting than life. Same with American Pickers. It's larger than life. There is no doubt about it. Okay, let's talk about a few things that I notice that are a little off with American Pickers, right? There are a few things. Now, I have been recently, this last summer, we went and stopped by after hours to their shop out there. Their shop in Iowa. And it wasn't open. It was well lit. We walked around. We peeked in. There's stuff in there. There's a merchandise shop. It's all nice and shiny. It's a heck of a lot smaller than you would think. They do some business out of there. However, it is not a working shop anymore other than they, they apparently they do some selling. They do some photo work there. They do some um, moving things in and out. They have merchandise there. It's it's not a movie set. It's sort of like a working movie set, though. I haven't been to Nashville. I do know that Mike and Frank have other channels to move their stuff. I haven't been to Frank's personal shop, but Frank supposedly has a shop. Um, Danielle supposedly has some sort of a shop. I'm sure Mike has some sort of a shop. Um, they do a lot of wholesaling stuff out to other experts too. People buy from them. They're buying high-end stuff. They're buying interesting stuff. They have enough meat on the bones sometimes to move that stuff along. Now, most recently, in the last three, four years, uh, I think they're getting big paydays. The number that I heard recently was a half million dollars a year each, Mike and Frank, for the show. That's a lot of Scooby-Doo. Maybe it's more. They also have endorsements, so who knows? I mean, they did that corny subway thing for a while. Now, I will admit, I haven't watched American Pickers probably in the last year, maybe even 15 months. I may pick it up again. This, this video and that question got me kind of excited to, to look in at them. I used to go in and uh, I would just buy all their episodes on iTunes and I would watch them. And then I'd go back and watch them some other time, so I'd probably watch them twice total. And of course, when you're in the hotel and it's late at night and you don't feel like doing anything else, you sit there and you hope it's American Pickers night, you can just turn that on, right? Now, there are a few quirky things with the American Pickers show. One of them, they go out and they do the pick, and obviously there's production crew there, and there's production value, and they've got lighting sometimes, they've got angles sometimes, they probably have to do many takes, they probably, uh, you know, they might have to have a negotiation, and they might say, hey, we didn't get it, and they might have to say, keep dialoguing about it. Who knows, okay? The items are there, Mike and Frank are there, money is exchanged, it could be subsidized, who knows? But these little inserts that they do where the pick is going on and before, after, and during, they pop out and Mike will say something, 
Frank will say something, the person that's there will say something. They're usually in a different place and they and they'll say something, you know, like the 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 picker that they're buying from or the person that they're buying from will pop out and say, Yeah, I think those guys gave me a fair price. I was hoping to get a little more, but you know, they're good guys, da 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 da. And then, you know, they'll have another blurb where Mike will be like, Did you see that thing? I really like that thing. Whatever. They do a lot of those on green screen, if you didn't notice. <laughs> so, I don't know how exactly they do it, but they'll do their shoot and then they'll be like, hey, Mike and Frank, we got, you know, here's, here, here's an idea. We got to do these different outtakes. Remember that item? We want to do an outtake on that. Remember this item, we want to say something about that. And then they go to the person who they're there and they're like, okay, what did you think of Mike and Frank? And they'll ask him like 10 or 20 questions, probably. They do those sometimes later in front of a green screen and they try to match it to whatever landscape they're in. Watch closely, you can see that. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. It adds to the value of the show. It's like using one camera versus two cameras versus three cameras. And then from there, you do some outtakes with some other cameras. You do some titling and graphics. And they, you know, they do different things from time to time. They have uh, uh, different little inserts and things like that. That's, that's the value of having a production crew. Now, if I had uh, a million dollar a year budget for a production crew for my crazy picker life, I guarantee you my show value would be a lot higher, but that's not how it is. So for those of you that are building a picking business, there's a lot of different directions you can go with it, right? Mike and Frank, they start back here. Mike's making, you know, a living buying and selling bicycles and doing whatever else. You know, he probably had his hand in a number of things. He's seems seems very entrepreneurial on the surface and um you know there's signs that he's got different things going he's got books out there he's got uh some sort of lighting refinishing refurbishing business he's got a number of things going on right he's probably got uh endorsement deals you know the the picker van that they got right now the rumor is they got that uh free from ford so, I mean, they, they've got some deals going, right? Frank, same thing. Little lower key, he's got some things going. They came from reasonably humble picking backgrounds. They got good at it. They took their risks. Somewhere along the line, they got pitched. Mike pitched. Somebody put together this idea for this show. History Channel picks it up. Takes a while to get going. Man, that thing gains traction, right? As a picker, that's like the pinnacle. You've done it. You've made it. I mean, imagine getting paid, what, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars per episode of doing a show? Sure, it takes a week of your time. Those guys work hard. They work hard picking and they're on the camera. They got people mobbing them. They, they're busy. That, you know, they pay the price for that. More power to them. It's almost like a bromance, right? I, I, I like those guys. I really deeply like those guys. And, and I believe the show without the cameras could happen. And then the show happens and the cameras are there. And it is a setup for the cameras, but it's real stuff. That could happen and it would happen without them. I don't know if that makes sense. It needs to be presented in a different way. Now, I'm going to let you in on something else. This show, The Crazy Picker Life, in a sm much smaller level, is also a setup. I mean, I don't just sit here on a Sunday in front of my sign wall, which I like, but I put here because I knew I would shoot film in front of it. It's not quite done, and it's probably not going to get done. I mean, you look back here, when we do our shows, I don't even know if we did it last time, we've actually got lighting 
and that big old tripod. And I guess in case we have a fire, there's the fire extinguisher. And in case somebody needs to, Ralph, there's a bucket. There's my orders I packed. There's my table that I use for a laptop when I have one. There's a power strip. Oh my goodness, did these stools just appear here? There's a production here. <laughs> Oh my goodness, this wasn't this wasn't just by chance. I just started talking about something. You mean this this was canned? This was a setup? Dealer was talking about this in his brain since at least yesterday when he got the question and before that he was like, "Oh my goodness, here comes Sunday again. I got to come up with a topic again." I run a daily vlog. I can't let everybody down. I can't end my streak. I can't not have an episode 196. It's a setup. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's funny, isn't it? That's YouTube. That's TV. That's movie. This is based on real life, what's going on. This conversation I'm having is based on my experience. When we stroll around my office, that's based on my real life. It isn't necessarily my real life. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a setup of my real life. Yes, I'm packing these orders, but I don't sit there and usually talk to myself and show my items off to somebody. I don't sit there and take a film of them and talk about them. That's a setup. It slows me down. I actually have to think about it a little bit before I go into it. I have to send my production crew in ahead of time and set it up. Here's my production crew. You're looking at them. Here's my equipment, this camera. I got to make sure my battery is charged. I got to make sure my free screen is flipped up. Got to make sure my camera's still working. Got to sure, make sure I have the right angle because there's some angles with lighting in this place where all of a sudden everything goes dark. But that doesn't mean what I'm doing is not happening. If the camera was off, I'd be packing orders. I'd be packing the same items in the same orders. I'd be having the same sales. I'm just showing it. It's the same with American Pickers. Those guys did it before they still do it during the show yes it's changed they could load up their van now and they could just take the stuff right back to who they bought it from they could take it somewhere else they could sell it wholesale they could give it away to the family of the cast and crew i don't know what they do now mike's gotta mike and frank gotta be thinking a little bit differently when they're getting $50,000 an episode. Now, I remember 2010, 2011, it wasn't too long after the show came out. And I was, I was watching, I believe it was David Letterman, and Letterman had Mike on. And of course, the show didn't take long to become popular. It became popular quickly and by the end of the first year i mean it was you knew it was going to be a hit it was a hit and i think letterman had uh mike on and he was doing his interview thing and mike was really you could tell he was nervous you could tell he was not uh, a hollywood celebrity you could tell he was out of his element and uh letterman had no idea what to make of this guy you know you buy and sell junk what you know what and then, you know, Letterman comes up with some tough questions and he goes, man, you, you know, you really make a killing on those items, right? What, what do you, you know, how much do you sell a year? Somehow, a how much did you sell a year question came, came out. How much, you know, how much you're making, you got to be rolling it, rolling in this junk. You know, part of it is capitalism. There's a certain stigma between the idea of you're buying something from somebody cheap and you're. You're, you know, you're like, see ya, and you take their thing and you sell it to somebody else expensive, thus screwing the person you bought it from because you only paid them 200 and you sold it to them for a thousand. Oh my goodness, that's capitalism, right? 
So let him in, being that he's in with the politically correct and basically the screwed up society that he deals with. <laughs> I like Letterman for the most part, by the way. Uh, and, and I like some people in Hollywood, by the way. But for the most part, that whole thing, oh my goodness, you know, it's not real. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> so he, he asked Mike, you know, oh, you, you know, you must be rolling in it. And Mike said something like, oh, we, I don't know, we sold 220,000 or 250,000 or 280,000 or 200,000. He said something like that. And Letterman was so taken back. You know, selling stuff. I don't have my, uh, I have my phone turned off on Sundays, but it vibrates. Letterman was so taken back because obviously Letterman, I don't know how many million a year he was getting under contract, but you could just see he was like, Man, this guy works hard for his money because Letterman's getting millions of dollars an episode or something for running, you know, doing his late night show there or whatever, right? He's rolling in it. And here's this interesting guy, Mike Wolf. And Mike Wolf is, by Letterman standards, struggling. You know, he's not a movie star. What? You only sold a quarter million dollars last year? And Mike's like, yeah, yeah, and I get to do this for, I get to do this for my living. <laughs> Mike's in love with it. He just loves to be a picker. You know, that's the other thing. These guys just, they just love it. And that's why I love it, because I love picking. So, it's real. And... I think that's the last thing I'll talk about is both Mike and Frank love what they do. They love the traveling. They love the windshield time. You get the freedom of having your office on the move. They love being out talking to people. They love the treasure hunt. They love finding something they haven't seen. They love finding another one of something they knew they could score on. I like that a lot too. That's why I like the treasure hunt. I like watching the consolidated version of their adventures. Probably why some of you like watching this show. Although obviously we're not American pickers in a sense. We don't have the production value. We find some pretty fun stuff. And you know, we're, we're kind of a, a, in a sense a linking point between maybe us and then the next level might be American Pickers, you know? So, <sighs> I didn't have my coffee yet. <laughs> it's my new excuse since I'm not drinking energy drinks very much. I'm, I'm trying to stay away from the sugary XYZ rock star fruit punch. That's my that's my big vice, Rockstar Fruit Punch. And my body's feeling it, both good and bad. Um, that stuff will kill you. It also peps you up. It also, it also brings you up. It also keeps you alert. And um, I need my coffee today. <laughs> uh, Wheeler's supposed to poke his head down here after he runs. We've got nice warm temperatures. The roads are all sloppy from the from the uh, snow melting and uh, he's out there slogging through I guess a two mile or whatever run. I hope he doesn't push it too hard because he's just maybe getting over his sickness and he needs to get over that. You don't want to hang you don't want to hang in that. All right so I hope that this video has been interesting and in a sense has answered the question why my fascination with the American Pickers. Have I ever met them? No. Do I want to meet them? I, you know, I would meet them. I would chat with them. I'd like to have a beer with Frank or Mike and Frank. Uh, do I need to go picking with them? No, not really. I mean, you can see them on the show. It would be more of a, a hassle than anything else. But, I, you know, when I get to Nashville, I'll stop by their shop. <clears throat> we may try to do a little more research and see if we can stop by Frank's uh, shop this next time through or one of these next times through uh, to Wisconsin, maybe. 
Um, I, I'm not in awe of them. I just, I just really enjoy the way the show is put together. I really enjoy that. In fact, I think I'll have to uh, buy the next set of episodes if there's some new ones out, and I'll just, I'll just do that. I don't know how many seasons of them I own, but I, I own them on um, iTunes. Thanks for watching. I appreciate all the thumbs up. We've had a couple of long uh, videos, teaching videos, the last couple of days. Uh, here's another one, I guess. <laughs> this week coming up, I don't see anything out of the ordinary. We're just going to have around the office stuff. There are quite a few developments. Every time Lon and I sit down, there's quite a few developments on... Um, full-time picking, which is what we're going to be doing in 500 days. One of these days, I'm going to say 499. I need a countdown somewhere around here where I can tear uh, a page off every day or uh, maybe a reverse calendar, something, because I'm getting excited. There's some things that have come out uh, in our plan that are getting exciting. So we'll share that maybe this week sometime. Maybe I'll talk about that on Tuesday. Tuesday I'll probably take another day off. I know, I take a lot of days off now. I'm getting soft. <laughs> it's all this fame, right? It's all this YouTube fame. I'm, I'm backing off, man. I don't need to, I don't need all this grind anymore. I've got this uh, 20 cents here and 20 cents there from YouTube coming in. <laughs> <laughs> woo woo! <laughs> By the way, if uh, if there's any production companies out there, um, <laughs> you want to do a Crazy Picker Life uh, show, uh, you can approach me at the address below in the about. I don't know if we would do it. It would be very in intrusive to our family life. The, uh, the YouTube, I can control that. I don't know if I could control a production crew. I don't think so. <laughs> and control means could I handle it? I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Appreciate the comments and the questions and the thumbs up and the support. We'll be back tomorrow with a regular daily vlog. Probably do some packing. Show you what we've sold. And we'll be back tomorrow. Pick well. List off and dealer out. Hey, Wheeler. Dealer production. <laughs>